presentations, role play, as well as fun at camp. Sign up today at probe.org and help them meet these challenges to their faith. Jenna Ellis in the morning on American Family Radio. I love talking about the things of God because of truth and the biblical worldview. The U.S. Constitution obligates our government to preserve and protect the rights that our founders recognize come from God our Creator, not our government. I believe that Scripture in the Bible is very clear that God is the one that raised up each of you and God has allowed us to be brought here to this specific moment in time. This is Jenna Ellis in the morning. Good morning. It is Wednesday, April 17th. And as I was perusing the headlines this morning and also last night, just looking at everything from the Mayorkas impeachment that is finally moving over to the Senate and Democrats, of course, don't want to have a trial there, uh, which is the process that the Constitution requires under Article 1, but they want to somehow circumvent it. When I listened to the Supreme Court oral argument yesterday in the January 6th case about the DOJ manipulating and contorting a statute uh, out of its origin and and basically taking it completely out of context as an evidentiary tampering statute and trying to apply this to obstruction of an official proceeding in order to have the possible outcome up to 20 years in prison as I'm looking at the Supreme Court uh, backing Ohio's law protecting minors from uh, bodily mutilation surgery. Good thing. And then also this headline this morning from the Wall Street Journal, Arizona lawmakers are expected to make a bipartisan push to repeal the abortion ban. So as soon as we get a conservative win, then all of a sudden, bipartisan, mind you, this isn't just a a Democrat-led legislature and governor's office. Now we're pushing to repeal that. The, The overarching point that... I just sat back and, and thought, I, I've, I've got to rant about this this morning, is that we are in an existential crisis as conservatives. And Christians hopefully are not. Hopefully we have our understanding of who we are and who uh, presented us to the reality to which we, we live. And we have moral absolutes that guide our lives and guide the institutions that God has ordained if we understand this on an intellectual level. And that is, of course, the family government, the church government, and also civil government. But right now, when we look at civil government, it is a total mess. And we can talk about each of these individual stories. And I want to play a little bit of sound from the oral argument yesterday that that just encapsulates this total, chaotic, ridiculous just lack of understanding and 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 I think it's an intentional ignorance of moral law and how it is discoverable in nature when you look at what the left and increasingly the new right is trying to do which is simply to win simply to be political and play the game of politics because if you take morality out of our human existence and you take it out and you think that the laws of nature simply mean that we are only confined to a a purely empirical type of dispassionate observation and our universe uh, just is is completely amoral it doesn't have a right it doesn't have a wrong then the universe ceases to be rationally intelligible. And and these are big concepts that we need to unpack. Uh, but I want to take a few minutes to do that because the entire sum of what we talk about every morning in terms of the headlines and what's going on, um, I know that, that if you're listening and you are a Christian and therefore you have a Christian worldview on how our government should legitimately function and operate, then you are, like me, reading these headlines and thinking, what is going on in our culture that conservatives 
or, or the so-called conservatives, the new right and increasingly the Republican Party for the last, and this has been going on for the last, you know, 20, even you know, longer than that, 20, 30, 40 years, that they're just seeding all of the, the, the moral absolutes because they merely want to win. That's the whole point of a big tent conservatism is saying, I don't care what you think or what you believe or what's legitimate. I just care that you vote for me so that, or vote for my party so that I can win. And if you extrapolate that to its logical conclusion, that is a leftist proposition, which is exactly what the Solicitor General was arguing to the Supreme Court yesterday and what the... DA is arguing in the Trump New York case, uh, by the way, that's that's going on, and it's in the third day of jury selection, because justice no longer means anything except a political win. And that offends us as Christians because we understand that justice requires an anchoring in truth. Without truth, you can't have justice, or at least meaningful justice. But the left, linguistically, wants to try to take that word justice and reinvent it into something that is totally antithetical to what God means and what reality means by justice. If you look at what's going on in the New York case, if you look at what was argued yesterday at the Supreme Court, it's totally arbitrary. Just because we want to, you know, we being the left in this instance, want to persecute our political opponents, then justice can mean whatever we want it to mean. And the Solicitor General yesterday is arguing that this statute that had no context whatsoever for the J6ers, now we can apply that, and she, w- she was totally contorting herself into a pretzel, trying to elaborate on why the DOJ is choosing to use that statute to come after J6ers, but not any of the other violent protesters. And Justice Gorsuch thoroughly dismantled her by asking, why haven't you used this in the past for all of these other types of instances? So listen to this. This is cut six. If I might. Um, so so what, what does that mean for the breadth of this statute? Um, would a sit-in that disrupts a trial or access to a federal courthouse qualify? Would a heckler in today's audience qualify or at the State of the Union address? Would pulling a fire alarm uh, uh, before a vote qualify for 20 years in federal prison? There are multiple elements of the statute that I think might not be satisfied by those hypotheticals, and it relates to the point I was going to make to the Chief Justice about the breadth of this statute. Uh, the, the kind of built-in limitations are the things that I think would potentially suggest that many of those things wouldn't be something the government could charge or prove as 1512c2 beyond a reasonable doubt, would include the fact that the actus reus does require obstruction, which we understand to be a meaningful interference. So that means that if you have some minor disruption or delay or some minimal Outburst. Okay, we so, don't think it falls so within the my, my to outbursts begin with. require uh, uh, the court to, 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 to reconvene after, after um, the, the proceeding has been brought back into line, or uh, the, the pulling of the fire alarm, the vote has to be rescheduled, or uh, the, the protest outside of a courthouse makes it inaccessible for a period of time. Are those all federal felonies subject to 20 years in prison? So with some of them, it would be necessary to show nexus. So with respect to the protest outside assume, the courthouse, we'd I can, have to show that, yes, they I were aiming I've at shown, the proceeding. I, yeah, they were trying to stop the proceeding. Yes, and then we'd also have to be able to prove that they acted corruptly, and this sets a stringent mens rea. It's not even just the mere intent to obstruct. We have to show that also, but we have to show that they had corrupt intent in acting in that way. We and went around that tree yesterday. I, I know. I, I, uh, I heard the argument yesterday. But I guess what I would say is that to the extent that your hypotheticals are pressing on the idea of a peaceful protest, even one that's quite disruptive, it's not clear to me that the government would be able to show that each of so those protesters had corrupt intent. So mostly peaceful protests that actually obstructs and impedes an, an official proceeding for an indefinite period would not be covered? Not or? necessarily. We would just have to have the evidence of intent. And that's a oh, high no, bar. They, I, 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 they, they right. intend to do it all right. This is total madness. 
it's it's ridiculous madness and she's trying on purpose to convolute the issue and you can just hear the frustration in justice gorsuch because he's actually a rational thinker um for the most part i i really like his jurisprudence of course you know he's off on on a few other uh elements that that we could go down that rabbit hole and we have but but this is just utter madness it has no coherency other than and if she was totally honest about her position the solicitor general she would simply say we wanted to charge this because we think that january 6th was the worst possible uh violent protest in the history of america because these were trump supporters these were conservatives and so we want to throw the book at them with anything that we can possibly derive from the text of the law and, and push it on that. And we've declined to do that in the sit-ins at the Kavanaugh uh, protests and, and the trials uh, at, uh, during his uh, confirmation hearing, not the trial, but the sit-ins at, at the Kavanaugh protests, the pulling of a fire alarm that one of the Democrat representatives did in Congress, the hecklers um, in the crowds and the, the violent uh, pro-Palestinian protests that we've seen even over the last few days, these so-called mostly peaceful protests that were literally burning buildings and destroying property in the summer of 2020, that that doesn't, you know, we, we're okay with that as the left. So we just chose in our prosecutorial discretion not to go after them, and we want to go after the J6ers. If she had said that, at least she would be intellectually honest. But she's trying to force this really manipulated definition of this statute that doesn't apply at all to the conduct just so that she can justify going after the J6ers with harsher penalties and sanctions simply to prove a political point. And that's what the left does. And and we should expect that from the left and we should hopefully have and and be able to capture in the uh in in some of the the elements of and the safeguards of our constitutional framework we should be able to stop that and capture those political uh pushback and and those political intentions before they ever are fruitful but but what's happening is that it's like republicans are just manipulating ourselves into pretzels as well and i say are even though i'm not a registered republican but conservatives generally um and and we're basically seeding this and we're arguing this from a secular approach rather than intellectual consistency. And C.S. Lewis said it very well when he said this, men became scientific because they expected law in nature and they expected law in nature because they believed in a law giver. When we stop as a society saying that our universe is rationally intelligible and it is also ethical and has moral dimensions, then we are ceding the ground to this Marxist utopia that is redefining justice, which is derived from truth, into a mere political question and saying that as long as we can force our will toward a political end, then that is all that justice requires. And that, that should offend us as conservatives, as Christians, because we know that justice is derived from truth. We expect natural law to be inherently moral. We have an inherent and an innate sense of justice and of solid definitions of predictability and of understanding that justice is is not political. It doesn't matter who is in control, if it's a left versus right, who our political opponents are, that justice requires truth. And for juries, for example, like the one going on in New York, a jury needs to get to the ultimate question of fact, which is based on the truth. And and if people say, Well, why does truth matter? Well, do you want do you want the true answer or do you want the false one? Truth is inherently necessary to do the business of governing. And Nancy Piercy described the the secular approach and how we've gotten so off in her book, Saving Leonardo. And if you haven't read that book, it, it's incredible. Every work by Nancy Piercy, I highly recommend. But she described it this way. A secular approach to politics first took root in universities. Scholars decided that the study of politi politics must be, quote unquote, scientific, by which they meant value-free. 
As a consequence, political theory was no longer animated by a moral vision. It became purely pragmatic. This represented a radical departure from the heritage of the American founders. At the birth of our nation, politics was assumed to be a profoundly moral enterprise, the pursuit of moral ideas such as justice, fairness, and the common good. James Madison, principal author of the U.S. Constitution, said that the goal of government was to secure, quote, the public good. But today, after decades of treating politics as value-free, many political scientists reject the very concept of a transcendent good, basically a measurable difference of right and wrong, good and evil. Thus, the fact-value split, the idea that humans can have genuine knowledge only in the realm of empirical facts. Morality was reduced to subjective preferences, and I would add, if I may, political opportunism. So the term values means literally whatever the individual or the political party happens to value. And in this instance, of course, what we are seeing in 2024 is that the left values absolutely crushing their political opponents. And that's why the Solicitor General can stand up and say to the U.S. Supreme Court, we want to go after the J6ers with the harshest penalties, and we are going to turn a blind eye to BLM and their violent riots and their destruction of property because we agree with their viewpoint and we don't agree with conservatives or Trump supporters. And they think in their warped secular humanist view that that actually is enacting justice. They think that it is a righteous cause that they are pursuing because politics has been completely separated from objective value. And so we as conservatives and as uh, as Christians, we have to go back to the values and rather than define winning and defining justice as simply crushing our political opponents or that type of political opportunism, we have to come back to the foundation of understanding that laws are not the product of natural unguided forces, but the product of a rational creator, and more than that, a personal creator. The universe is not without boundaries and rationality. We have to discover what justice means by seeking a personal God who is the personification of truth. And one of the best explanations for this was was given in context um, in what's titled One of the Deepest Conversations You Will Listen to About God. This was Jordan Peterson's conversation with one of my absolute favorite apologists, Dr. John Lennox. And in, in this context of describing how the the universe is word based and when god said i am i am right and then he said i am truth i'm the way the truth and the life words have meaning that reflect ultimately god our father and and this is and the personification of truth um this is what what john lennox had to say it's cut seven I'm a mathematician by background and a linguist. I love language, and mathematics is a very sophisticated language, but I love natural languages as well. And it seems to me that where this fits together best is first in the fact that we can do science in the sense that there is a rational intelligibility to the universe, which is the foundation of modern science and is a legacy of the biblical worldview. So that the mathematical describability, uh, Einstein talked about he couldn't imagine any genuine scientist without faith in that. It's the axiom for doing science is to believe the universe is intelligible. But if you ask for the rationale behind that, why do we believe the universe is intelligible? It bears the imprint of a creator. And I see that at the level of mathematics, it has capacity to, at least in part, give us a handle on what's out there. And also in biology, where we we have at the heart of every living cell the longest word we've ever found, the genetic code. And all of that leads me to formulate it as follows, that we live in a word-based universe. 
And th that's the key of the Logos for me. Okay, and so what do you mean in that case? So what do you mean specifically that we live in a word-based universe? What does that mean for you on the broader conceptual landscape? Well, it means that this universe is not simply a product of natural, unguided forces. It is a product of a rational creator, an intelligent creator, and I believe even more than that, a personal creator. Now, how I get there is only in part from a response to the universe as I find it, the point you made about each organism being a microcosm of its environment. It's also, it seems to me that there are two sources, two major sources of knowledge. Uh, there is, first of all, observing the universe, science, etc. Then there are the humanities. But there's also the concept of revelation, in which I believe. In other words, it's not simply the human quest for the creator. It's the creator revealing himself. So for me, the anchor point in the end is that the Logos became human and we beheld his glory. In other words, we can see exactly what this means in terms of what we can understand. That is the human uh, being in which God encoded himself in Christ. Now, those are big ideas, of course. They're very deep ideas. They need unpacking. But that's essentially where I'm coming from. John Lennox and universal morality, a self-evident truth, is the central standard of right and wrong, including ethics in government action. And this is for our own good. We have to hold our government to that. As the Apostle Paul wrote, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We'll be right back. Let's see, if something costs less, but people are happier with it, that sounds like something to look into, and that is MediShare. And maybe you've heard switching to MediShare to pay for health care can save many families up to 500 bucks a month, and that's huge. But it's also true people are way more satisfied after making the switch, too. The member satisfaction rate for MediShare is double that of the typical health insurance plan. Double. MediShare works, too. It's been around for 30 years. Members have shared more than $5 billion of each other's bills. People love having telehealth and a huge nationwide PPO network. So, yeah, really, you can save a ton and like it better. Imagine being happy with how you're taking care of your health care. So if you're self-employed or part of the gig economy or you just want a plan you're happy with, you can call right now and get a price within two minutes. See what you can save. This is a very, very smart use of two minutes. Here's the number you need. Call 833-44-BIBLE. That's 833-44-BIBLE. 833-44-BIBLE. Abortion has remained the world's leading cause of death for the fifth consecutive year. Tragically, this total is greater than the entire number attributed to the next seven causes of death combined. I'm Dan Steiner, the president of Preborn, inviting you to join us in turning this thing around every day. Preborn's network of clinics rescues 200 babies. You see, by introducing a mother to her child on an ultrasound, a baby's chance of survival doubles. 200 babies is truly miraculous, but our work has only begun. As by the time I'm finished with this life-saving message, two babies will be aborted, just right here in America. Let's make 2024 the biggest baby-saving year in history. An ultrasound can be the difference between the life and death of a child. For just $28, you can sponsor one ultrasound, and $140 helps to save five babies. Just dial pound 250 and say the keyword baby, or donate securely at preborn.com. That's preborn.com. The Word of God tells us many times in one form or another, fear not. Many people are very fearful about some of the many perils and dangerous happenings that are going on in the world. Psalm 91 verses one and two tell us, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him, I will trust. I'm Joseph Parker, and we here at the American Family Association would like to remind you, fear not, put your trust in the Lord. We'd like to both encourage and challenge you to aggressively put your faith to work. And one way to do that is to pray Psalm 91 daily for yourself and your family. 
and keep your trust in Him. If you'd like to get a copy of the Psalm 91 prayer for yourself, email us here at psalm91 at afa.net. Again, that's psalm91 at afa.net. Welcome back to Jenna Ellis in the Morning on American Family Radio. Welcome back. And as we are talking about the lack of truthfulness, the lack of morality in our civil society and how the left is simply looking at justice and perverting this term into meaning political opportunism, we're seeing a great example of that in this headline from uh, the Daily Mail. The Bank of America accused of religious and political discrimination by debanking or refusing to service Trump supporters, Christian churches, and Republican-led states, and uh, the Republican-led states want answers. So the Kansas Attorney General is sending a letter to Bank of America CEO seeking answers, and his letter was co-signed by officials from a dozen Republican-led states, and this details this letter, how the bank appears to discriminate against Christians. So let's welcome in Tho Bishop, who is our um, resident economic uh, <laughs> expert, I suppose, and uh, from the Mises Institute. And we always appreciate your commentary. So Tho, um, this this is just ridiculous. And, and yet, unlike the the Twitter files, which um, now the Missouri Attorney General in um, in Murphy versus Biden that that went all the way up to the Supreme Court is suggesting that this is unlawful and uh, and contravenes the First Amendment because government can't use a big tech private platform to accomplish its goals um, and and thereby basically capturing it as an agent, and that all makes sense. And we and and I hope that the Supreme Court has the correct outcome there. But what do we do when it's a tyranny of the elite institutions that are privatized and someone like the Bank of America just says, well, we want to discriminate and we can do that because go somewhere else. Yes, this is one of the real challenges that is facing the right. And I think that you have seen a uh, an important pivot in recent years uh, dealing with this because Nothing about this story should be surprising. Um, after you know, a lot of the – some of the domestic aspects of the Patriot Act stuff dealt with, New York lender laws and things like that, which um, helped create a framework for really kind of weaponizing uh, banks against people that the regime at Washington doesn't like. We've seen debanking campaigns go on in the past for – I mean it's, it, Certain uh, gun manufacturers have been challenged. Uh, certain conservative activists have been challenged, um, and so it was only a matter of time before that to hit broadly uh, Christian groups. And so the issue is that all the incentives, all the dynamics that the federal government has, allows for private companies to actually discriminate against the right. Um, there's, it does not go the other way. Right, and so the question then is, what can state governments? I think I think that's the important battlefield here, is reigniting that tension of federalism, where state governments, either through laws, whether through the, their attorney generals and any attempts at, at of trying to get answers from a from a legal perspective, or doing uh, their own form of of kind of customer protection laws, uh, Florida. Uh, recently passed legislation that would make it more difficult um, for larger banks to discriminate based off of political viewpoints and things like that. I think this is a, an area where red states must take a, a more aggressive approach when dealing with these large national um, – particularly Bank of America, its size, its influence in the economy is overly – is artificially inflated by federal policy. These are not creations from the market, and therefore when we recognize that fact, I think the question for states is how do you protect your citizens? How do you protect your, your, your support base from the actions of these large artificially inflated, artificially powerful institutions? And I think that's one of the most important battlefields out there, um, and again, it's one that we're seeing on multiple fronts going forward. 
Yeah, and I think that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, you and I, and, and I think most <laughs> rational conservatives want to continue to limit government. I mean, we've seen um, the, the federal government bloated beyond belief and way out of uh, the original uh, design of federalism. And yet, when it comes to the legitimacy of government, we aren't libertarians in kind of a capital L sense that think that that government um, is a an, an necessary evil in the sense that uh, government doesn't have any legitimate purpose other than what we can agree upon the, for just some very, very basic protections. And then because because a true libertarian standpoint would be, well, Bank of America is free to do this. They they have freedom of association and they can um, th- they can discriminate as long as it's you know not necessarily a, a contract dispute. Um, or, or so forth. And so it's it's limiting government even apart from legitimate functions. And so a, a classic conservative position would be that um, that some government regulation and and I think you're right to point to the states uh, for this, but some government regulation in terms of more consumer protection is necessary. And we've we saw the lack of that protection when it came to, Small businesses um, such as Masterpiece Cake Shop, for example, and 303 Creative, where um, the customer came in and wanted a unique design and for the owners to participate in their speech. And what the Supreme Court said, uh, basically in both cases, was that um, that that customers can't force a an owner to participate in their speech, but if a customer is coming in regardless of their identity and they're just basically getting an off-the-shelf product, then a business can't discriminate against them based on their intrinsic characteristics and, and protected classes, which would include religious beliefs. And I think that we need to, as a society, include political beliefs as well. And that's what should happen for Bank of America. Okay, and I, I would I would prefer to live in that property rights society that would allow Bank of America to, to discriminate and have that freedom of association. That would be the society that, that I would rather have. The problem that we have in America right now is that – and that was the foundation really of, of the Western tradition was a legal system grounded in property rights. This was, you know, this was, this was a, a, you know, the founding um, uh, kind of nature of, of the American project. The problem is and this is this is why I think some of those libertarian or you know, traditional conservative, hey, let the businesses do whatever they want mindset needs to be challenged on certain in certain fields like this. It's the pivot away from a property rights environment to a civil rights environment, a positive rights environment. And what has what that has done is that it's completely shifted, where basically you cannot discriminate against the supporters. The, it basically against the left people, right? You know, the, the the people, the, the patrons of the the, the the patronage of the regime. Those people can't be discriminated against. It's people. It is it's everyone on the other side that you can discriminate against. You can discriminate against you know the unvaccinated during COVID. You can discriminate against Christians. Um, you know you you can discriminate against Trump supporters. And that's the thing that so long as we have this environment that has been created. As long as we have this civil rights environment, then those protections must be – then then the other side, the right, must fight for the same protections the left fights for their own. Because if not, then you create an economy that beyond the you know, the, beyond all, all the economic deformities and the taxation, the inflation, and all the things that we can talk about in that perspective, just the, the ability for the largest economic institutions to discriminate – uh, to, to to further uneven that playing field is going to result in America where people that have our beliefs, our values, are going to to be further disadvantaged, rather uh, against those that have have a lot of, on the other side of things. And so this is where again, if you're a Republican in a in a red state in particular, are you going to essentially allow D.C. To set the economic environment in your state, or are you going to take an active force in trying to even trying to balance out the policies in that framework in, in, within D.C. That, again, that's that's what DeSantis has done in a variety of ways in Florida. That's what we're seeing, I think, increasingly more red state governors wanting to do, but it requires kind of replacing bumper sticker kind of conservatism with a real uh, a rigorous understanding 
of just what has gone on to this country, what is the economic and legal environment, it takes you know, it, it takes serious analysis and not simply you know outsourcing your ideas to whatever your state chamber of commerce wants. Yeah, I'm speaking with Tho Bishop from Mises Institute, and you're so right that we can't just have bumper sticker conservatism like taxation is theft and, you know, get off my lawn and you know some of these other things without having a deeper understanding and a coherent worldview of politics and policy. And rather than just saying, well, you can't discriminate against me because I'm a Trump supporter or you can't discriminate against me because, you know, my freedom, basically, um, I, I think you're right to frame it as a, a battle between two different schools of thought um, of a civil rights versus property rights framework. And if we go back to the property rights framework, um, that would be better ultimately for everyone and it would be more fundamentally fair as well. Uh, but we're currently in a civil rights framework uh, that the left has completely captured. And those that civil rights environment um, that has bled into legal opinions currently doesn't cover uh, conservatives and uh, political viewpoints. It only covers the identities that the left has manufactured, and increasingly so, it, they're not even applying it to uh, religious freedom and religious viewpoints. And so we're fighting, I think, a battle on on a ground that we're not actually even understanding the points of engagement that are genuinely meaningful. And so if we can't in the short term get to a property rights framework, um, then, and we just have about 30 seconds left, um, how, do we, how do we fight this on a civil rights framework that's meaningful? Yeah, I, I, again, I think it's, it's, it's stronger consumer protections at the state level. It creating, what, what matters to me is, is creating greater friction so that you know, the policies of DC that, this, this, that states are creating bulwarks against the consequences of the policies of D.C. We, we need more tension between D.C. and the states. And I think, again, I think we're, 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 leading, we're turning that direction. That's a very positive thing. And I think it's the best thing we do in the short term while we fight the long-term battle for what the, the future ideology uh, that drives our nation looks like. Well said, though, Bishop, and uh, so much more to unpack there. And we always run out of time. That's why I tell Tim I could, I could spend five hours on the radio in the morning. But we'll be right back with more here on Jenna Ellis in the morning. To all of our friends on American Family Radio, this is Michael Brown. Thrilled to announce to you that we have a brand new 30-minute daily equipping broadcast that will light a fresh fire in your life and will infuse you with faith and truth and courage to help you stand strong in the Lord. It's coming your way 1230 every single night, five days a week. Don't miss a single broadcast on the line of fire. I believe your life will be changed. Target is in the bullseye because of its transgender bathroom policy. A petition by the American Family Association to boycott Target now surpassing a million signatures and counting. People have their own beliefs and stuff, but what could it hurt? What could it hurt? What could it hurt? Could it, hurt? it hurts our daughters. It hurts you. It hurts our families. It hurts me. It hurts, me. It it hurts, hurts all, all of us. us. Sign the petition to boycott Target at AFA.net. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on earth. My name is Abraham Hamilton III, and this is the Hamilton Minute. Jonathan Haidt, a social psychologist at NYU, said the rise of smartphones are directly attributable to the decay of Generation Z and the rise of mental illness. He said, all of a sudden, boom, in the blink of an eye, childhood became about sitting down and looking at a screen hour after hour, year after year. And that, I believe, is the major reason why rates of mental illness go skyrocketing around 2012, 2013. The very concept of social media, desperately fighting for attention, has been detrimental to adolescents because they're learning these behaviors during puberty. Listen each weekday from 5 to 6 p.m. Central for The Hamilton Corner or visit the podcast page at AFR.net for more from Abraham Hamilton III, public policy analyst for the American Family Association. We live in a day when America's families are under attack like never before. Buddy Smith, 
Senior Vice President of the American Family Association. The war against biblical principles rages on numerous fronts. The internet, Hollywood, Washington, D.C., America's corporate boardrooms, and the list goes on. At American Family Association, we're committed to standing against the enemies of God, the enemies of your family, and we recognize it's an impossible task without God's favor and your partnership. Thank you for being faithful to pray for this ministry, to give financially, and to respond to our calls for activism. What you do on the home front is crucial to what we do on the battlefront. We praise God for your faithfulness, and may He give us many victories in the battles ahead as we work together to restore our nation's biblical foundations. Welcome back to Jenna Ellis in the Morning on American Family Radio. Welcome back. And as we are talking about the principles of our founding being grounded in property rights versus this leftist reinvention of so-called civil rights that they twist and contort the definitions to their preferred political outcomes, uh, there is... No better example than what just happened yesterday with a federal appeals court that has overturned a West Virginia transgender sports ban, finding that the law violates Title uh, IX and the federal civil rights law that prohibits sex-based discrimination in schools. Again, this is absolutely ridiculous. It is it is a contortion of justice that now just means what the left's righteous cause is, is their preferred political outcome. Well, the Independent Council on Women's Sports uh, posted this on X, formerly known as Twitter, in response. The first, the Fourth Circuit's decision is baffling. They contort Title IX into something unrecognizable, suggesting that women and girls are defined by self-image and beliefs of men, unworthy of legal recognition or protection. The rights of women and girls nationwide hinge on sanity prevailing when this case reaches the Supreme Court. And, and I would just add to that, it requires a return to a moral objective truth that is grounded in our Judeo-Christian founding, because if we can just arbitrarily determine uh, what sex means, <laughs> like the Bostock decision, which unfortunately Gorsuch was uh, was a, a chief author of, of that terrible decision, that sex can mean whatever we want it to mean, and it's not the biological inherent difference between men and women, then we're reinventing reality according to our political purposes. And that goes back to original sin, which is that man wanted to be like God. So joining me now is uh, Bill Bach, who is the former general counsel for the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency and is representing the female athletes in the ICONS uh, lawsuit. So, Bill, um, I, I know that you are a very sincere Christian as well, but um, your, your, just, your reaction overall to this utter nonsense that is being perpetuated by the left to not protect women in sports. Yeah, ICONS said it well, it referred to insanity. Um, when I look at this Fourth Circuit panel decision, it, the, the panel has attempted to erase in law any objective distinction between men and women, and that sets us on a path for elimination of women's sport and, and maybe put in, in a less legal terms, their reasoning would allow Bronny James or Zach Eady, who is the NCAA Player of the Year, to play against Caitlin Clark in a, in a college basketball game. It's utterly ridiculous. And so how do we confront from a from, I guess, more of a, a strategic and uh, standpoint and, and perhaps philosophical um, in in terms of fighting for this and fighting for truth and the measurable difference between male and female, uh, and which gets us also to the measurable difference between right and wrong and, and ultimately a moral good, which is to protect women's sports, when the left just wants to completely redefine everything that Title X stands for, everything that our law stands for, everything justice stands for. And, and I feel like sometimes as advocates, when we go into a courtroom and, and say, look, there's an obvious difference between men and women, and they just don't care, uh, where are we left? Yeah, you know, I think um, we, we need to, uh, to start with the, the, the battle over language. Um, everything is being redefined, and I think uh, a lot of times conservatives are 
are, are nice. They want to get along. They want to choose their their battles. And um, and we lose sight of the fact that when we lose uh, lose the language, we we lose arguments. And this is a this case is an equal protection case. It it, it means that um, you can't treat people differently that are similarly situated. Um, and the problem comes in. In a, in a case like this, um, when there's an argument um, over who is similarly situated to a woman, when you call somebody a trans woman, and and um, I, I think what we need to, particularly in the sport uh, scenario, but really in, in all scenarios, we need to recognize that biology is real, science is real, it provides answers, and 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 to to make cogent arguments, you have to make distinctions. So we shouldn't be saying that um, we, we shouldn't buy into the terminology of a cis woman um, and trans woman as if they're both women. They're not. They're, there's there a a trans woman is a male biologically. They may want to be a woman, but they are male objectively. And, and a cis woman is not a cis woman. A cis woman is a female. And, and I think – so I think it starts with the language, Jenna. Absolutely. I think you were completely right. Uh, Bill Bach, who is the uh, former general counsel for the U.S. Uh, Anti-Doping Agency and representing these female athletes uh, with – icons. And uh, and you're right, because secular humanism, um, this atheist view that elevates the, the creation, uh, which of course is human beings, to being like God um, and, and saying that we can create our own reality, really does, through language, seek to encode a different reality and a different God by claiming and redefining words so that they can create a different reality. I mean, it's like encoding DNA to create a, a different living thing or encoding a computer language to build software. I mean, the word becomes reality. And this, this for Christians, goes back um, to the premise I, I said uh, way earlier on in the program, Bill. I don't know if you heard it, but you, the, this um, proposition from John Lennox speaking to um, Jordan Peterson, who was saying, you know, th- this is why foundationally we are a word-based universe. And when um, the Apostle John started his epistle by talking about um, in the beginning was the word. Um, and then when the word became flesh, when God became a man so that we could, through our very limited ability to discover reality, um, through uh, how how we understand those things and, and rationally um, have an intelligible universe, um, God made himself into a, a human being that we could rationally relate to. And and the left, I think, you know, this is a much bigger proposition than just um, they're trying to blur the lines in, in gender nonsense reality. I mean, they're literally trying to redefine what words mean so that they can create an alternate reality. And the legal opinions are now unfortunately, a lot of these are buying into those propositions. And as any policy debater knows, and any lawyer um, like you, Bill Bach, would, would know, whoever defines words to their advantage will win the ultimate outcome. And so language matters and terms of art matter. And it used to be in, in legal parlance that when we had terms of art, it was a commonly understood definition of what we were talking about. But if nobody knows what we're talking about. Are we talking about a woman or a trans woman? And on all of these blurred lines, then we can never get to truth because truth is subjective. And then we can never get to justice. I I totally agree. And it's certainly in in the um, legal context. I mean, the, the, the dissent in this case um, was actually pretty good. It was um, the, the, the majority opinion was joined by, uh, a Obama appointee and a Biden appointee. The dissent was by a George uh, Bush appointee, which is, is is a little bit interesting. But but um, but the dissent even bought it, buys into the the terminology usage of the left, and and I think it, it weakens the impact of of the analysis. And and it's it's just important for people that believe in objective truth 
um, to to recognize that in in all facets and particularly in in the words they use um, and, and without obviously um, a, a clear defined uh, objective meaning for terminology you can't have progress in society you can't have progress in science people ultimately can't communicate um, and and so uh, that it's it's a it's a big problem and i think uh, one that you're right to address yeah, and this ultimately then devolves our society into utter chaos, because if we can't use words to communicate and language to communicate um, that describes a commonly understood um, either point that is that is either um, a you know rational, tangible object, or if it's more of a, an esoteric concept, um, you know whether it's you know conceptual or or, or based, uh, then we can't do anything we can't accomplish anything we can't move further and so then this becomes a completely irrational body of law and and do you do you think or do you have hope that at least maybe um the supreme court understands this and we can have a more rational conversation or at least you know some, the majority of the supreme court if this case progresses further to at least draw the line and say no it is not rational that trans woman means woman we have to clearly define what our words speak of that that then describe a physical object which you know our bodies are physical and the descriptions that we use to describe them uh, have to have meaning yeah um, I do have a lot of hope for when this issue does reach the Supreme Court, um, even in the Bostock decision. And, and um, you know, I think uh, people fall on either side of, of uh, um, Justice Gorsuch's reasoning there. But but even in that decision, which uh, a, a lot of us don't don't like very much, um, he he recognized that biological sex or, or sex means biological sex in terms of, of Title seven. And he explicitly said that. And, and so I do have a, a lot of hope that the Supreme Court um, will do a lot better job than a lot of the appellate courts have on on this issue, because I think they understand that you don't have law any longer um, when you, you just have decisions made by rule makers um, and unbounded by any constraints. If they can change the terminology to mean whatever uh, they want it to mean, and and ultimately, you know, this is this is an issue uh, of uh, of freedom. It's an issue of preserving democracy, because we don't have we won't have a free society any longer if if the the people that interpret the laws can just change the meaning of the laws. Then elections don't matter at that point. So. Um, exactly. The, the Supreme Court uh, understands that. Um, they understand the importance of textualism um, and original intent. Um, those are principles that even uh, liberal justices, when they're in their Senate hearings, subscribe to or say they subscribe to. Um, because, because it's rational. It, it, it make, because it makes sense. And, yes. And, and people think you're crazy if you don't say that. <laughs> um, and and you are. Sense. And, the, and, and you are. Because, yes, exactly. And, and Bill Buck, I so appreciate your time. And I hope that you have success in, in the icons um, case representing these women because sex, biological sex is not an abstract concept. It is very concrete. And and you're absolutely right that uh, when they're in their confirmation hearings, then they try to appear rational. And then we get when they get on the bench, they have the ridiculous conversation uh, like we observed yesterday and listened to in the January 6th case where, you know, the, the Solicitor General was actually arguing that the statute can be lifted and contorted and perverted out of all meaning just to achieve their political outcome. But remember, remember, my friends, what the Gospel of John says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through all, through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing 
was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. We must overcome by turning to truth, who is a person, our creator God. You can always reach me and my team, Jenna, at AFR.net. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast may not necessarily reflect those of the American Family Association or American Family Radio.